24 hours makes a big difference. If you had been here last night, some of you were, um, you would have seen some of us who will be making some comments up here in a slightly different look, we'll say. Uh, last night was the Overlake Show. It's a traditional event that goes on here that, that is, I, I, I think it's uniquely Overlake. And that's sort of what, what this is about and this celebration of that, is finding what are those things that makes Overlake special? What is it that an Overlake graduate has that makes them somewhat different? And as I've talked a couple times to people about this and about the 50th and why I think it's so important, it really is to convey that message. Who are we? And what does it mean to have gone through eight years, four years, whatever it may have been, or even a longer time as being part of this Overlake community? As I said to our seniors, they have something, and our, and our alums, they have something that, that not everyone will share. I'm not an Overlake alum. I've been here a few years, but I'm not an Overlake alum. However, I still enjoy being part of the things that make Overlake really special, and last night was one of them. As you would have seen the, the head of school uh, doing some daredevil feats on a scooter. Uh, you would have seen uh, other faculty up here as the faculty and staff demonstrating their singing and choreography skills, from the Spice Girls to uh, uh, the Grateful Dead. And it was, it was quite, a, quite an event for the kids and, and really showed us who we are because it was the faculty, it was the staff, and it was the students all taking part in something that really makes us special and a lot of fun. So the 50 is about that. It's recognizing those things and recognizing today, hearing from some people who've been part of that at different times and what it has meant to them in their, in their lives and some of the say in their, in their entire lives and some you know, for the time here and beyond, and, and we really want to, to celebrate that, and this is, this is our opportunity. My father, Dean Palmer, was hired as headmaster of the Overlake School in the spring of 1970 at 32 years of age. He had previously been a teacher and then head of middle school at Charles Wright Academy in Tacoma, and at that time, Overlake was located in the basement of the YMCA on Bellway Road. There were about 50 students and a handful of teachers, resulting in classes of four to five students each. Two years later, <clears throat> after convincing the Board of Trustees that this was Overlake's future, 113 students and a burgeoning faculty moved to an unfinished 48-acre campus without occupancy permits, I might add, <laughs> that had been purchased from the parents of a then Overlake student. That campus is where we gather today. I was going into the fourth grade at the time. My first memory of seeing the campus was on one of the tours that my dad and mom gave to prospective families, teachers, and donors. My younger sisters and I dutifully tagged along on the tour until we reached the lowest of the buildings on the campus, then a cow barn, now the TLC. The lower level had empty stalls, and the large open area on the top level was presumably for hay storage, as it had a very high ceiling and a giant hook that ran on a track on the center beam of the roof. In the hillside pasture corner of that open area, we found a trap door that opened to a pile of hay below, and while my parents entertained their guests, my sisters and I lagged behind and had the time of our lives as we jumped through the trap door into the hay pile, then climbed back up the ladder to do it again and again and again. At the time, I couldn't have imagined that just three years later, I would sit in the exact spot of that trap door as I tried to conjugate verbs in seventh grade French. A few years after that, my sister Ashley was suspended from that same hay hook, a relic saved in the initial remodel when she performed as Peter in Peter Pan and flew over the audience that was seated on, her, on the floor on her way to the stage at the far end of the building. Overlake in the 1970s foreshadowed the innovative culture that permeates the Pacific Northwest now. It was a startup in the truest sense of the word, as everyone that had anything to do with the school students, teachers, parents, and administrators was somehow involved in its evolution. We all literally took part in the building of the school. It was akin to a barn raising, and everyone wore a lot of hats out of necessity. And while it might sound a little like organized chaos, and I'm sure at times it probably was, my dad believed in the adage that many hands made light work. 
His vision of what Overlake could become included the idea that investing human capital to help create the school's campus was the best way to ensure that the Overlake community would blossom along with its physical assets. One example of this occurred a couple of years after the move to Redmond. Everyone was told that announcements were being held down on the large area of bulldozed dirt, which is now the site of a big turf field. All 170 plus students and the faculty gathered, and we were told to stand shoulder to shoulder in a straight line along the bottom of the big hill. We were then instructed to slowly, very slowly, work our way across the bulldozed area toward the entrance to the school as we bent over and picked up every single rock we could find. <laughs> a brand new soccer field was about to be seeded, and not only was there money to be saved by having us do the work of prepping the soil, but Dad knew that each one of us there that day would have a certain pride of ownership of that field that only comes from having had a hand in its creation. I started at Overlake as a seventh grader, the earliest grade there was at the time, in the fall of 1973. You might think that being the daughter of the headmaster in a small school would be a tough gig socially. Not so much. It never crossed my mind that I was treated any differently than any other student on campus. Yes, I called many of my teachers by their first names, but so did everyone. In fact, I don't think I was alone in feeling that my teachers at Overlake were more like my extended family, aunts, uncles, and older cousins. I, like most alums, have strong memories of certain classes and teachers. Army was my honors English teacher and my tennis coach. I still play competitively and often hear his voice in my ear. I also work for his wife Anna in the registrar's office for at least one summer. Jean Orvis, now a retired founding head of Seattle Academy, brought mythology to life for me in the classroom. By the way, first was the classroom with the hay pile. She opened my eyes to the world through the Voyageurs program. There were 20 of us, traveling in two vans, camping throughout Europe for six weeks over the summer following my sophomore year. An amazing experience. There was science with Denver, math with Trevor, and drama with Myra. And there was Don's Weirs, who in addition to teaching us eighth grade math, he also taught us how to juggle on the side. And yes, there was one class I had to take from my father. It was my senior year, and he was the only one that taught a required current events class. As you might imagine, it was pretty tough to get away from not doing my homework here. <laughs> when I wasn't in the classroom in my first few years at Overlake, you could usually find me in the pastures or local trails riding one of the horses that the school inherited along with their purchase of the farm. But while in high school, my favorite part of the day was athletics, soccer, skiing, basketball, and tennis. I loved pushing myself physically and emotionally alongside my teammates as we walked toward, worked toward a common goal. Even more, I loved the energy and excitement of competing for my school. It truly fed my soul. I graduated from Overlake in June of 1979, headed for Stanford, full of curiosity, nervously excited for what lay ahead, but believing, perhaps naively, that I could do anything. The knowledge, skills, and most importantly, the self-confidence that I gained through my experiences at Overlay, both inside and outside the classroom, not only successfully launched me into the next phase of my life in college, but ultimately shaped the person that I am today. Flash forward about 20 years from my Overlay graduation. I had a fantastic four years at Stanford. There I met my husband, and together we have three amazing boys. I was fortunate to, en to enjoy a 15-year career, mostly at Microsoft, but I chose to end in 2000 in order to spend more time with our sons. My father had passed away in 1993, and our oldest son had just been accepted to the sixth grade of the Overlake School. Talk about deja vu. I remember sitting in the student chairs in Army's English class at parents' night, listening to him tell us about our kids' public speaking assignments and thinking, how lucky is my kid to get to come to this place? Even though many of the structures have changed, the spirit 
and the energy around campus felt very much the same to me. Being back here as a parent and then as a trustee in this place that held so many memories for me and my family was incredibly special. And now, 15 plus years, three high school graduations, and three college graduations, <laughs> after that sixth grade acceptance letter, I find it remarkable, I find it heartwarming, and I find it so reassuring that that same energy is still very much a part of the school. Although my dad was a product of East Coast prep schools and an Ivy League college, I know that he was proud of the fact that Overlake was not made in that mold. Rather, it reflected a more Pacific Northwest set of values and attitudes. In the 1970s, the Overlake culture was informal without being alternative. It was one of high expectations, but with a tolerance for making mistakes along the way. It embraced differences in student learning styles, but faculty worked hard to ensure that every student succeeded. It valued faculty innovation while still honoring traditional educational principles. If my father were here today, I think that he would agree with me that each and every one of those things is still true. <coughs> Dean Palmer is no doubt smiling down on all of us right now, reveling in the fact that the Overlake School, the school that he championed for so long, is thriving. Thank you very much. I enrolled at, in, at Overlake uh, in seventh grade, and as a result, I never had the privilege of learning in Catherine Fink's classroom. Ms. Fink was a sixth grade teacher, and, and so she was never my teacher, but she taught me a lesson that has stuck with me for years, something that summarizes, I think, quite well what I have carried with me from my time at Overlake. Ms. Fink hung a sign on the door to her classroom. I passed it every day, heading to my locker or to my homeroom. The sign read, take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of this place. I want to talk a little bit today about those three ideas um, and, and what, I, what they mean to me now, what they meant to me when I was here at Overlake. Overlake encouraged me to look inward, to identify and pursue my passions. I explored new subjects, honed skills that shaped what I studied in college, my path to law school, and the direction of my legal career. I can list so many examples of educators and administrators going above and beyond to encourage me, to challenge me, and to support my success. Dave Bennett, admitting an over-eager freshman into his civics and government elective, where I would read the same first amendment cases that we study as first-year law students, and nailed that cold call. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Uh, math teacher Benjamin Goldstein meeting me at 6.15 in the morning at least once a week to coach me through AP Calculus. It didn't matter that he and I both knew I never wanted to be a mathematician. It only mattered that I believed I could. English teacher Dot Boyack casting me as a first-time first actor with a pretty terrible singing voice in a featured role in The Music Man. Fortunately for, not, for audiences, I never had another solo after that show. <laughs> but I now frequent the theater so often that I joke I'm receiving a JD with a minor in Broadway. Art teacher C. Jack, even though I wasn't in her class recognizing my interest in photography and giving me gallery space right, right out here in Fulton, lending me the confidence to seek a job as a photographer in college, and, and now I shoot weddings as a side gig. Ryan Burke, crafting an impromptu coaching seminar during my year as ASB president, encouraged me to consider leadership as not merely the completion of tasks, but a commitment to empowering others, and in the process, teaching me to be self-critical in a healthy and constructive manner. Frank Rehalva, understanding that his role was not just as an administrator, <coughs> but as a mentor for all students. Frank emailed me while I studied abroad in college, inviting me to represent Overlake at a conference on human trafficking in Egypt. That conference eventually got me my first job at Polaris. An English teacher, Sarah Gallagher, offering suggestions on my law school application essay a decade after I was in class, 
and that is clearly worked. <laughs> These examples are just a few of the dozens I could cite, and they were not experiences unique to me. I watched the same commitment to each of my classmates. And although many of these teachers have moved on, I know the ethos here remains the same. Overlake also encouraged me to look outward, to critically question the world around me, to identify ways that I can care for others. It was this part of my education that brought me to law school and to a career in human rights. Ten years ago, I spoke about the Global Service Program in Cambodia, focusing on a quotation from Victor Hugo, he who opens a school door closes a prison. While one reading of the project in Cambodia understands over Lake Pailin as closing prisons of poverty and insecurity for the Cambodian students, I believe that opening the school doors of over Lake Pailin freed us, the Redmond students, from insularity and ignorance. Through this global service project, we saw the world and our role in it in new promising ways. We gained an understanding of the human condition and an appreciation for a way of life that has far less to do with acquiring material things than building community and character. I'm a human rights advocate because of what I learned on that trip. And back on the Redmond campus, teachers did not shy away from engaging difficult subjects, both in and outside the classroom. They bridged the textbook and the real world, showing us that learning about inequality, racism, climate change, violence, public health, injustice, can itself be an act of caring. Greg Bamford's Race and Ethnicity History elective found a group of mostly white students grappling with institutionalized racism and our invisible knapsacks of privilege. Every few months, most recently after Charlottesville, a post on Facebook appears from someone in that class, referencing some reading or a discussion. Greg created an environment in which we assumed the best intentions of each other and confronted topics rarely addressed so openly on this campus. Another history elective taught by Dave Bennett asked students to examine American complicity in genocide, ranging from the Holocaust to the then ongoing massacres in Sudan. That course is why I work on armed conflict issues, fighting for transparency and the use of force by the U.S. government. And I still carry my dog-eared copy of Samantha Power's book, the book for that class, with me every time I move. This innovation, this trust that middle school and high school students are capable of grappling with complex problems, this encouragement to apply what they've learned to real-world solutions, that's what separates Overlake from many other schools. That's what makes an Overlake education unique. And finally, taking care of this place. All that makes Overlake special doesn't just happen. It is created every day by administrators and trustees who are committed to realizing the mission through every strategic decision they make, by selfless staff who keep every aspect of this institution running, whether it's feeding hundreds of people, keeping the campus beautiful, or paying the bills to literally keep the lights on, by dedicated educators who know their students as individuals and understand that their influence is hardly limited to imparting the rules of grammar or physics. And especially by the students themselves, who take ownership not just of their education, but for developing relationships here that will take them through their lives. The keys to Overlake's 50 year success and the challenges we face for the next 50 can be found right here in the words of the mission statement. Develop intellectual curiosity. Overlake encourages our students to invest in themselves as scholars, as artists, as athletes, as humans. We instruct students that passions are to be boldly chased, that there is no one correct career or resume or job title. We are also challenged to find new and innovative ways to foster learning. Teach responsibility. Overlake understands that education is not a commodity and students and their families are not consumers. We teach our students that societies can be strong and peaceful and vibrant, but this requires us to be engaged citizens, to be active stewards. We are challenged to consider how current events, changes in our nation and our world, must influence how we prepare our students to engage as informed and responsible citizens. Embrace diversity. Overlake strives to create a community that is reflective of the ideals we espouse, where diverse points of view are welcome. 
we are challenged to continually centralize the value of diversity in everything from admissions to hiring and from classroom discussions to finances. Foster a compassionate community. Overlake demands that our students show respect for their peers, that they treat each other with kindness. Overlake works to be a supportive environment for students of all identities, especially as students' identities develop and change through their time here. We are challenged to consider how, as a very privileged institution, a school upon a hill, we demonstrate generosity to our neighbors in need, and how we instill giving, compassion, and openness as a lifelong habit in our graduates. Inspire excellence. Overlake reminds our students that success is defined not by where they receive college admissions or the digits on their eventual paychecks, but by what they do with the immense gift of their education. In tumultuous times like these, I hold tightly to the gift of my education and to the love and joy I experienced here. I am grateful to this community, and especially to my parents, for inspiring me to excellence in all I do. My wish for the Overlay community, as we celebrate 50 years together, is that we take steps daily to practice that mantra from Miss King's store. Take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of this place. Thank you.